Welcome, <clears throat> bienvenue to the 10th annual Respectful Workplace Week 2022 Beyond COVID. Participants can opt for simultaneous translation using the drop down menu at the right um, side of the, at the bottom of their screens using the globe icon. Les participants peuvent opter pour l'interprétation simultanée en utilisant les menus déroulants en bas à droite de leur écran. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Sheila Burt, Acting Associate Director of the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center and member mm -hmm. of the Workplace Violence and Abuse Research Team. I will be your moderator for the day. The Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research is dedicated to collaborative, action-oriented research on family violence and violence against women and children. The Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center was established in 1993 by the University of New Brunswick and the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Foundation. Housed within UNB's Faculty of Arts, the MMFC, as we call it, is a member of the Alliance of Canadian Research Centres on Gender-Based Violence. The Workplace Violence and Abuse Research Team supports, conducts, and disseminates research that deepens our understanding of the ways in which New Brunswickers experience bullying, harassment, and other forms of violence and abuse in their workplace. Team members include academics, human resource professionals, government representatives, in addition to organizing and hosting Respectful Workplace Week each year. I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research resides on the unsurrendered <clears throat> and unceded traditional lands of the Lewistikme, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. This territory, upon which we conduct our work is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Wallistiquay and Mi'kmaq peoples first signed with the British crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of the lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wallistiquay title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. It is important to recognize as we work together to decolonize our thoughts and practices that the land upon which we live nurtures and protects us, our families, our friends, as well as the colleagues and students connected to us. I encourage you to reflect on the critical task of truth and reconciliation as we move forward together. I would like to take a moment now to provide a very brief orientation to the Zoom platform that we are using today. This webinar and the rest of them uh, throughout the day will be recorded and will be made available later on the Muriel McQueen Ferguson website. We will be sending a notice out to uh, attendees to let them know when the videos are available. If you have any technical difficulties today, please let us know using the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We do have technical support on hand who is monitoring that chat to help troubleshoot any issues as they arise. And I want to thank Brianna for helping perform that function with us today. Because of the size of the audience, participants' videos are off and their microphones are muted. And when they join the call, and they will remain so throughout the sessions. Questions and comments are welcome using the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. And I will be monitoring the Q&A and will read audience questions at the end of each presentation. <clears throat> Participants are registered for the full day and can come and go as they please over the course of the day. And you can opt for simultaneous translation again using the drop down menu at the bottom right of your screens using the globe icon. I'd also like to give a shout out, a special thank you to our sponsors who enable us to provide this event at no cost to participants. This year's sponsors include Public Legal Education and Information Service of New Brunswick, WorkSafe New Brunswick, NB Power, the University of New Brunswick and the Government of New Brunswick. This is the final day of our Respectful Workplace virtual conference. All of the presentations and discussions today will focus on trauma-informed workplaces. It is now my pleasure 
um, to introduce uh, the session that is happening first off this morning, Nurses, How Are You? Kathy Rogers, our presenter, after spending 17 years with the federal and provincial governments, 14 years in academia with sociology, as a sociology professor, and six years in politics as Minister of Social Development and Minister of Finance, Dr. Rogers now does research and education to support the New Brunswick Nurses Union's nurses member, nurse members. Her presentation today is based upon the findings from two surveys of New Brunswick nurses over the past year. The surveys asked how nurses are faring amid a growing labor shortage, a pandemic, and working longer hours without relief. Findings from the first survey are in a report entitled, We Are Not Okay, and represents the responses of registered nurses and nurse practitioners. And the second, that with licensed practical nurses, is in a report entitled, Please Help Us. Both reports reveal the frontline professionals' heartfelt words describing what they believe to be worsening work conditions, healthcare, and their own well being, largely due to the healthcare crisis related to labor shortages. Kathy, thank you for being here this morning. I'll turn it over to you. Good morning. Thank you so much, Sheila, for the kind introduction. And thank you for being such a great uh, facilitator and host for this uh, event. Um, thank you for the opportunity uh, for me to be part of this. I think it's a very valuable week. I'm so glad that Labor, for example, has been invited to share in this initiative. And I think this is a great example of respect when we can work together as part of a collaboration of management and frontline workers. So it's a good start. Uh, as a former sociology professor, um, I taught a course for both UNB and Crandall over 14 years called Sociology of Work. I can assure you that creating healthy and safe workplace benefits workers and society at large. I can also assure you that creating workplaces free from discrimination and harassment, where culture fosters dignity for all, where it benefits workers and society at large, um, serves well. I can also assure you that creating respectful workplaces that promote individual and organizational well being helps to create broader societal well being. In essence, when employees, can work without being victim to unsafe emotional, psychological, and physical harm and abusive behavior, they thrive and they generate better, and it generates better outcomes in the workplace too. A bonus, respectful workplaces with healthy and well workers foster full labor force participation and in turn a growing economy and a more well society at large. And isn't that what everyone wants? That again, this day is devoted to frontline workers is also a step in the right direction of respect. It acknowledges expert knowledge and professional experience that resides there and it's very worthy of hearing. And to start off the day from nurses, very much appreciated. So I'm here today, obviously on behalf of the New Brunswick Nurses Union, which represents approximately 9,000 licensed practical nurses, registered nurses and nurse practitioners. NBU really exists to support our members' well being in their professional practice. I want to just share a past study. In, in, sorry, in 2020, the Canadian Federation of Nur Nurses released results from a study they did looking at mental health disorder symptoms present among nurses in Canada. Given the excessive demands on them, even pre COVID and the growing labor shortage, and at a time when healthcare demands have grown to become unrealistic and unsustainable, the study confirmed what nurses already knew, that the workplace has become, quote, a pressure cooker for frontline nurses in healthcare facilities regularly over capacity. And take note, this was before COVID even took more nurses out of commission and brought even more patients needing healthcare and the situation certainly has continued to worsen to the point of crisis across the country today as we face labor shortages. In the summer of 2021, the New Brunswick Nurses Union wanted to know what the situation was in New Brunswick. 
So we embarked on a study to ask nurses how they were doing. <coughs> Knowing already the study nationally a year prior, reporting mental and physical health decline in the face of a growing labor shortage and increasing demands, knowing already that the demands on New Brunswick's nurses were growing as well and that their work conditions were worsening. And also that even the nurses have been reporting increasingly that it's difficult to access needed time off and that they were working longer hours, knowing already that our own provincial health care system had been facing even pre-COVID deteriorating work conditions. Um, not to mention at that time, they were three years without a collective agreement at all. Our survey sought to investigate how well the nurses were coping with all of these things. And so the answer to how are you doing came back from RNs and NPs, we're not okay. And from licensed practical nurses, please help us. Their words also revealed some particularly alarming insights beyond just themselves, but into the workplace and their profession. Now, at the time we did the first study with uh, RNs and nurse practitioners, LPNs were not part of uh, the New Brunswick Nurses Union. So when they joined in the fall of 2021, we immediately uh, wanted to hear their voices. And so the results of both studies will be uh, shared today. In general, the findings of both uh, New Brunswick Nurses Union studies revealed that what New Brunswick nurses reported as experiences and personal impacts on their own health and well-being confirmed that the growing nurse shortage and the resulting, quote, cycle of excessive overtime and unsustainable workloads and widespread verbal and physical violence found across the country by CFNU study has indeed led to a decline in nurses' health in New Brunswick, too. All levels of nurses share feelings like, quote, their cups are empty and they have quote, nothing left to give. Research results were categorized to describe what nurses offered up from their vantage points about three things, the state of health care, which is their workplace, declining working conditions and associated outcomes for health care delivery, as well as their thought on current leadership and their own hope for change. They offered up as well their vantage point reflections on their own well-being and their greatest sources of stress and fatigue. And finally, alarming remarks about their own profession were shared, which even when talked about, several testified how grievous it was, the moral injury they live with daily, and the fact that they seem to be seeing no positive improvements made, leaving them to feel hopeless and to even ponder their future in their own profession, which they almost unanimously say they still love. It's important to highlight that despite their testimonies about desperation, fatigue, burnout, and thoughts of leaving public health care or their profession altogether, again, unanimously, nurses shared their passion they have for health care, for their patients, their residents, their clients. And increasingly, however, they just feel so handicapped and disabled in their profession that they chose where conditions prevent them from the full professional practice that they try so hard to do but increasingly cannot. So this morning I share the results of these two studies. We are not okay and please help us. We really believe at NBNU that to ameliorate conditions in the workplace, it's crucial that we first invest in the well-being of labor force participants, which are our nurses. Not doing so thwarts retention. Not doing so prevents recruitment and not doing so inhibits any return of nurses to the public health care system who have already left. All and any of these outcomes also exacerbate declining work conditions further and work against the goals of return, recruitment, and retention, not to mention those to build back a sustainable quality health care system for New Brunswick that all of our people expect and deserve. That's precisely why we believe it is right to first acknowledge the state of current healthcare conditions and service delivery, including the well being of its labor force. We believe that it's only then and that we can work together that we can rebuild the better healthcare system where health professionals are attracted to it and indeed can thrive in it. That's what makes a respectful workplace. 
So first, I want to share what LPNs, RNs, and NPs, nurse practitioners, had to say from their professional frontline experiences with patients, residents, and clients about their own workplace. That's New Brunswick's healthcare system. Okay, statistically, an alarming 91.73% of RNs and NPs and 77.2% of LPNs believe that even before COVID, but continuing the trend downward since, the quality of healthcare along with working conditions is getting worse. Even higher percentages of nurses, 93.23% of LPNs, for example, state their belief that patient care will continue to worsen unless there is a significant turnaround. So what's the reason for this expert assessment, we might ask? Primarily and almost unanimously stated by all levels of nurses at 85.45% is that it's the nurse shortage and the resulting unmanageable, unsustainable and ever increasing workload that is frankly unattainable, that is to blame. Because of this, nurses are working longer hours and more short staffed, so stressed and fatigued that they're unable to carry out the full scope of healthcare that they know they should and want to be doing. The moral injury is carried on their shoulders and it's also brought home with them to their families. Many cited, for example, that the work atmosphere because of this felt toxic because they were stretched so thin. Nurses fatigue, stress and overwork means that they're unable to access sufficient rest and recuperation with vacations, regular scheduled days off or even with needed meal and washroom breaks. And they believe this impacts the quality of patient care and work conditions. Certainly these are not conducive to retention, let alone recruitment or the return of nurses. <coughs> Ultimately, more than a quarter of nurses say they hold leadership to blame for a long-standing culture of acceptance. What impact does declining patient, resident, client health care, and deteriorating work conditions have on the health and well-being of, L of, of nurses, personally and professionally? So that's the second area looked at. Again, mirroring the mental health struggles found to be among nurses nationally reported by CFNU uh, earlier, New Brunswick nurses self-report alarming rates of decline in their own states of wellness and mostly due to the stresses of being short staffed with unrealistic demands on them. So here I'm gonna share just a few statistics gleaned from the surveys before I share some of the precise you know, stories and words that nurses shared. When it comes to mental health, over 83% of RNs and NPs testified to their mental health deteriorating over the past three years, and over 70% to their physical health doing the same. For LPNs, these stats are 74% and 59%. They tell us something important. Interestingly, a little over half of the 4,500 um, registered nurses and nurse practitioners only said that they sought mental health help. And almost 90% of these said that their main reason for seeking help was that they were unable to cope with unrealistic demands and the resulting stresses, anxiety, depression, insomnia, loss of time with their own families and hopelessness that ensued. It's important to also know, however, that those who held back from seeking mental health help offered explanations, even though they were not asked, as to why they didn't seek help. They said things like they felt guilty taking time away, quote, leaving their co-workers even more short, or they did not have the time or energy left over to take care of themselves, giving all they had at work. In fact, currently feeling very stressed and a five point scale was the highest or completely burnt out now. These responses fit onto the highest five point scale and working overtime, being unable to access vacation or even work, uh, even get work breaks was reported in both studies. In fact, New Brunswick's RNs and NPs, among them 97.64% reported not feeling rested. Plus que 87 ne se sentaient pas euh, reposés à la fin de la semaine. Et puis, pour les infirmières... 
of RNs and NPs and 84.3% of LPNs reported not feeling rested even at the start of their new shifts. This is most alarming. So besides being short staffed, overworked and not getting breaks to recover, nurses face verbal and physical violence almost daily from other patients, visitors and sometimes even stressed coworkers or supervisors. Because something must give in such strained conditions, what seems to have been giving is nurses' personal health and well-being and the quality of healthcare delivery. Again, the moral injury expressed so strongly throughout both studies takes its toll on nurses, their families, their patients, residents, and clients, and the profession itself. Just knowing what that, that they were educated and professionally trained to deliver healthcare in particular ways compared to the way that they're able to do it with today's decreasing resources um, leaves nurses going home not only worried and anxious, but experiencing insomnia, depression, family conflict, and out of desperation with thoughts about leaving their profession. So that leaves us with the final stats from the two studies, we're not okay and please help us. And these pertain to the utter powerlessness nurses feel to affect change and the hopelessness that they're left with. <clears throat> Literally when asked the question, would they recommend nursing as a profession to family and friends? 85.5% of RNs and NPs said they would not recommend the profession. 78.7% .7 of LPNs said the same thing. Further, when trying to ascertain just how powerless or hopeless or desperate they were in their work, the question was posed, if you could financially afford to leave your work today, would you do so? Almost half, 47.48% of RNs and NPs said that they would, and some said that they're already currently looking for alternatives. Some say they have an, quote, exit plan in place. The percentage was similar for LPNs at 45.7% who would leave now if they could. <coughs> you know, these mean that almost half of New Brunswick nurses want out. In spite of, remember, they said how much they love their professions. They bode very badly for hope to resolve the labor shortage with retention, recruitment and return and for the quality of healthcare in the province, not to mention for the nurses that are still hanging in there and now nearly at the end of their ropes. However, we don't want to be negative. We want to try to turn things around to a positive. Rather than crying gloom and doom after hearing these stark realities that New Brunswick's nurses describe and that we choose to respectfully hear because we need to, it's better that we acknowledge what we have heard that we show care and respect, and that we take strong and immediate action to rebuild the public health care system. This is the workspace for our healthcare workers' jobs. So there are a number of initiatives being considered around the world that include support for flexible working hours for healthcare workers, for women at the menopause stage of life, for example, for casual and part-time workers, for improved benefits and for investment in support workers so that LPNs, for example, are not called to perform administrative, pharmacy assistant or support worker roles. And for investment in more RNs and NPs so that LPNs are also not called to perform roles that in their words describe are beyond their scope of training and preparation, which they themselves say brings them fear and opens the doors to risks too high to be taking. Other ideas around helping retention and improving conditions of work being considered in the UK, for example, include providing affordable and flexible childcare, providing, quote, all staff with access to 24 seven hot food and drinks, free parking and places to rest, store their belongings, shower and change and take breaks with colleagues. This was taken directly from um, a workforce uh, recruitment training and retention and health and social care a document for the UK. Many New Brunswick nurses at all levels spoke of their repeatedly offering ideas and solutions upward, but not feeling heard. Rather, they had been dismissed, devalued, 
and feeling disrespected as if they do not have the expertise to speak into what's needed. They spoke about feeling like the system within which they work has become more interested in the financial bottom line than the quality of health care for patients, residents, and clients, as if operating a business rather than a place within which to regain one's health. It is to some extent the exact testimonials and the words of nurses shared openly and honestly that I end this presentation with now. Statistics, as I've always said as a sociologist, oftentimes tell us that there is a problem um, and how much of a problem there is, but it's qualitative research, words from those with lived experience that tell the story and the meaning behind the numbers. So here we go again in three categories, work environment, personal well-being impact, and the nursing profession. So first, from nurses, here's some of their own words describing the environment in which they work. And I'm going to read a list of, um, of um, quotes, so bear with me. <clears throat> First, um, about their workplace, which is healthcare. Quote, everything is exact words, by the way. The real problem is everyone is so short-staffed. This is unacceptable and unsafe for our parents, for our patients. The patient staff ratio is not safe for anyone. It was a struggle before the pandemic. It's a full out crisis now. My ER ICU units have suffered tremendously over the past two years. I see sick patients who could be seen by a doctor, but leaving the waiting room after eight or more hours of waiting, it's heartbreaking for me to watch this every day and night. Severe staff shortages mean we work with unsafe conditions where we're only able to provide bare minimum. Short staffing has made, my, made both my job and my patients less safe. Medication errors are always high when ratios are up. The morale is so low that it is creating a toxic environment contributing to an already crippled healthcare system ready to crumble. It's heartbreaking. More and more tasks are piled on us and expectations are unrealistic. The lack of staff in hospitals is dangerously high. They expect nurses to take care of elderly in improper spaces with lack of proper equipment, then poof, super RN, cover the delivery room, cover the ER trauma room, and all while just hope that our 89-year-old doesn't fall. Well, this old nurse is tired of the unhealthy and toxic workplace. I can't take it anymore. I have never seen the hospital so short-staffed like this in my 10 years. One RN is not enough for 60 residents. One says, the love I had for nursing 28 years ago is gone. I give 200% and care so much and get nothing back. I feel chest heaviness while I'm running through the hallways to, with pee dribbling down my leg. It's not even a humane job. We're forced to work like this because we're so short staffed. We're working in poor conditions and we're supposed to look after others. My mind and body can't even look after myself these days, let alone the sick and elderly. Thousands are retiring. Change needs to happen now. So many nurses are sick and leaving. Just now typing all this has given me heaviness in my arms. I'm spread way too thin to provide the safe and compassionate care that my patients deserve. I love nursing, it's my true passion, but I do not have the time to properly care for my patients' needs. The patient nurse ratio is horrible. I'm exhausted every day, mental, not physical. I have to retire early at 55. I just cannot keep up the pace anymore. We're exhausted, leaving. The morale gets so low, we're all so tired and stressed. I don't look forward to going to work like I used to. Staff feel like they cannot take on one more task or issue. We're like a whole lot of empty cups with nothing left to give. And then lastly, I'm a new grad and I already feel the immense pressure on RNs and all healthcare workers. So that's about their workplace. And I'll get less and less as we go to the other two sections. So let's hear what nurses had to say about the longer hours. Uh, I guess this is still a little bit about the workplace, but this is the longer hours. They're mandating nurses to stay extra hours. We refuse vacation days because of extremely low staffing. It's so hard feeling guilty, even calling in sick or taking a vacation or emergency day due to leaving my coworkers short being bullied into coming in on my days off or told I have to work on my days off. We need a vacation. We need better staffing ratios. 
it's hard coming into work knowing that you're always going to be short, not going to be able to take a break, even to eat or drink. The working conditions are bad. Working all nights and days and weekends makes me feel like I'm drowning. Um, and then what they had to say about leadership in their workplace. Management is telling us that we're okay when in fact we are not. The growing mental health and addiction crisis is just not being addressed. When we bring problems or ideas forward, management doesn't listen. I don't want a pat in the back. I want more staff help on the floor. I'm thrown into roles with little or no training. I've been in RN for 41 years. I feel very disrespected from our government. Our stress is creating a very toxic work environment. We have disconnected management who don't understand frontline issues. And then there's the pro professional practice anxiety and fear that results. It's what we call the moral dilemmas that nurses work with every day. And here's from an LPN. We're now being looked at as the solution to the RN shortage. Units in my hospital are converting empty RN positions to LPN positions and broadening our scope. It's unsafe. It's very stressful as an LPN being put in roles that we shouldn't be in. I'm always worried that I might forget to do something or not know when to take reports or that I might miss something. It gets very stressful. My biggest stress is going into work scared of being floated to another unit with no orientation. It feels unsafe. Safety is a huge issue. There's nothing to protect nurses from physical, emotional, and mental abuse. We just have to endure it. I foresee a tragedy happening if changes don't take place. I've been filling out professional practice reports almost daily. I've been in my unit almost 20 years, and I have never seen staff morale this bad. This seems to have been the worst three years in my nursing career. Let's move on to um, what this impact has on nurses themselves. <coughs> I think we're on slide 15. Being short staffed to the point of having critically unsafe conditions and healthcare delivery has an impact on nurses' well being being compromised. After having heard nurses' testimonials about the environment within which they work, let's hear what it means when they feel disrespected, when they're not given airtime, not being heard. Here are some of their very, very own quotes. Um, I've gained 30 pounds and I'm on antidepressants. I have never felt stress like this. There's so much anxiety caused by being short-staffed almost daily with unrealistic expectations. We're expected to do the work of multiple people at a faster pace. It's unsafe to patients and to ourselves. The stress of making medication errors is ever present. Even when returning home on days off, we cannot stop worrying about the next shift. We're working daily with low morale. Everyone is quick-tempered, feeling pulled from every area. It's not safe and it's difficult to go into work every day. My mental health forced me to increase my medications. I've lost the passion for my profession. I've lost endless coworkers and friends as many have left to work elsewhere. I'm getting less sleep, financially worse off and have less time with my children. Many talked about having trouble sleeping. My mental health has suffered as a result of feeling unsafe going to work so short staffed. I feel anxious even on my way to work knowing how bad the day will be. I'm so tired. My family suffers. I have nothing left in the tank for them. I have never felt this burnt out. I'm going to skip a few here. When I chose to become a nurse, my intent was to provide the best care possible to all my patients. Now I go home feeling like I'm a terrible person. All this takes a toll on my own mental health. I feel powerless, unheard. I feel trapped by my job. I can't get time off even if I ask a year in advance. We're all feeling the overwhelming weight of the New Brunswick healthcare system crumbling and we're not okay. I even worry about losing my license for fear of mistakes. <clears throat> One says 24 hour shifts should be made illegal. I'm never off a shift on time. Overtime has been insane. I've been working in mental health for 28 years, always worrying about client well-being, safety, doing my very best, Yet people are still suiciding and the constant negative attention makes keeping positive very hard. So you can see the sources of their uh, mental and physical health decline. And then finally, when they're at their wits end and they've tried every way possible with insufficient resources, 
and they feel so hopeless, their thoughts turn to leaving their profession. So here are some words on that. My workplace is unrealistic, unsafe. I'm thinking of leaving the career despite wanting to help people. There's no support to actually help. We're not robots. In my 14 years of being an LPN, I've never considered leaving the profession until now. I have nightmares about work because I hate being there. I've always felt my career choice was perfect. Helping people was a calling, but I no longer feel that way. I dread going, uh, the, I dread going into my job. I consider almost daily quitting my job to work in any other field. I think the only solution is to leave the profession at this point. I've never contemplated leaving nursing until now. That's a sad, sad thought. I regret this professional choice as one. I feel trapped, abused, and defeated. Another says, I love the work, but can't continue to work in it. Such a negative and demanding atmosphere. And then finally, overall, nurses are burnt out and will continue to exit the profession unless management makes the necessary changes, not only to keep staff, but also to recognize that nurses are human and need to recharge, which was said by an LPN. So when we hear the actual words behind the statistics, the realities they live in every day, um, it really puts more meaning. It's disturbing to hear nurses so burnt out, so much so that they contemplate leaving their jobs, even though they love them and they care very much, much about the healthcare system. So perhaps the last comment I shared, one made by the LPN only a couple of months ago, best expresses that we urgently need to um, turn the workplace around, you know, uh, in order to recognize that nurses are human and they do need to recharge. When we lose sight of our most valuable resource, our professional expert, caring and compassionate frontline nurses, we do end up rendering them inhuman. And, um, and another LPN articulated her comment, you know, we're not resources, no person can be sustained, let alone th thrive, when that's how they feel. Um, the output from worn out, tired, stressed out workers with insufficient resources is becoming severely compromised. So as we roll back to think, what is a respectful workplace? I go back to the beginning, to the very words describing this workplace, uh, respectful workplace initiative. A healthy workplace is one that fosters healthy and safe working conditions. That's not what we're seeing today in the healthcare sector. So what is a healthy workplace? It's one that's free from abuse and harassment, not one that considers or responds as though abuse and harassment is, quote, part of the job. It's not part of their jobs any more than it's part of a correctional officer's job in prisons to be victim to abuse and harassment. So again, what is a respectful workplace? It's one that adopts a culture that fosters dignity, which we know benefits workers and society at large. A healthy workplace promotes individual and organizational well-being. It recognizes that healthy workers make for a healthy society at large. It's in everyone's best interest. When healthcare professionals can work without suffering from unsafe emotional, psychological, and physical harm and abusive behavior, it's not only they who will thrive, but the healthcare outcomes they seek um, will also improve. And again, a respectful workplace with healthy and well workers fosters full labor force participation, and it brings the added benefits of a growing economy and a well society at large. You know, I remember back when I was a politician and visited businesses a lot, the number one um, thing they would answer when I asked, what, what are your greatest needs? They would say our labor force is our greatest need. We need a good quality, strong, sustainable labor force. That was before we were, we always forecasted the healthcare labor force shortage for many, many years. We forecasted it and did too little about it. But <clears throat> that was before the crisis we're in now. In healthcare, it hits to every single person. And so it's so important that we address the labor force shortage by first looking at how to retain, uh, return, and recruit nurses by improving working conditions and building on this respectful workplace. So thank you very much for your time today. I will open to some questions if there are any. And um, 
I might just end with, you know, I have seen some positive examples of what's happening. I know that uh, there's a great initiative going on at uh, Horizon Healthcare, for example, where they're implementing, uh, they just sent an email, a, a, a memo out this week uh, describing the implementation forthcoming uh, psychological health and safety framework, which is an example of a good initiative coming forward um, too often we thought about our physical health and not our mental health. And uh, so there are some good things happening, but I think we need to act stronger and faster. So I'll be quiet and open up to some questions. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of comments that I'd just like to um, read out. Um, so one is, I'm not a nurse, I am a teacher, but I am absolutely flabbergasted by these comments that you've made this morning. And I hope something is done and their situation improves. Their professional situation is really unacceptable. Um, another comment uh, is around how all healthcare workers are feeling the same in the system. Um, so another yeah, one. Can I just make a comment with regard to both of those? I think teachers yeah. are probably experiencing some of the same things. And uh, I realize this is all healthcare workers are feeling this too. Even the nurses expressed, um, you know, it's not just us, it's other healthcare workers too, it's physicians, it's cleaners, it's it's everybody. But of course my study was on nurses. So, right. but yeah, we do have empathy for um, the, the others as well. All right. So I invite folks to post questions using their Q and A um, function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, there's another, um, there is another question. Because this is such an important topic to hear about, is um, has media become aware of these reports, and um, you know, is anybody listening to to what's being said in the reports? I'm not sure. Uh, these reports have been sent to media, and uh, our president Paula Doucette has, on numerous times. Um, shared what is going on amongst our uh, nurse community and how serious the crises are. Um, but, you know, sometimes I think we have short attention spans. We don't read the details. And if we really could hear and read and see the detail, we might be more moved. I've always been one who thought the value of qualitative research of testimonials from people is that it puts meaning to numbers and if we can bring emotion and feel the impact, we're more likely to act with more urgency. So um, I guess we all have to become aware and spread the news. And, and it's not about spreading doom and gloom. It's about spreading news about the reality and how serious it is that we work together to take action to improve because none of us want this. We're all better when things are improved. Right. And we all recognize it'll take time to, to implement strategies to it address does. These as well. yeah and it's there's no easy solution there's no one you know one quick fix this has been a problem that's been um, building for many many years you know I remember again when I was a professor I, I, we're talking 20 years ago I remember standing in front of the classroom saying how the baby boomers are going to be retiring and we're going to have severe work work shortages and we need to be planning better and and I remember writing a paper about you know the workforce of 2000 well here now we're 2022 um and we are in the crisis because i don't believe um and and i i hold governments a lot accountable all all governments it's hard for governments to take long-term visions and long-term actions governments tend to make short-term decisions which are too often band-aid solutions instead of the long-term ones and this is the outcome of that um, but there are things we can do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, for your presentation this morning. Um, certainly, uh, it touched uh, uh, touched me. I have a daughter who is just newly um, graduated uh, as an LPN, and um, so I'm I'm hearing firsthand from her some of the things yeah. that you've, you've shared yeah. this morning. And we're so glad. And we still, of course highly recommend nursing as a profession the solution is we need more mm -hmm. and um and and it is a very rewarding career 
it's a very valuable, rewarding career. It's just the difficulty comes when the nurses feel that they can't provide the care that they've been educated and trained to do um, in the circumstances. And uh, we just never thought we would be seeing that here in our wonderful country, Canada, or in our province, New Brunswick. We expect that maybe in some places in the world, but but not here. So we'll work together to see what we can do to improve it. First, acknowledging the situation is the first step. Yes, I do have one other comment coming in that I'd like to read out. Mm -hmm. um, I am a nurse and my heart breaks for the healthcare situation and crisis. We spoke of these healthcare situation crisis in 2005 and were not heard. I work full time outside of Horizon Health and have wanted to work casual at the hospital on the weekends, but I'm afraid that will affect my mental health negatively. Plus having a family to be there on top of my work obligations. Uh, my working casual would only be a band-aid on a hemorrhaging healthcare system that needs immediate attention. So again, um, similar uh, yeah. comments as what you were hearing in your study. Yeah, so, similar sentiment. And you can tell just in her words that she you know she cares. She loves her profession. She wants to do more. But again, it's like when you when you need a ten thousand dollars for something urgently, but you've only got two dollars. It's right. it's not enough. Um, and and yes, it's uh, it, it's we. That's one of the things we can do. It's one of the solutions is to meet people where they're at. Meet nurses where they're at. You know, if part time is what works for their lives, well, grab them and and and. and reward flexible hours um you know we have to we have to uh, all in all workplaces uh, it's one of the things that uh, i've learned in studying work in general is that we have to recognize people as whole people not just workers they have families they have lives and uh, and if we have happy workers we have happy lives and and a better uh, community for so sure. yeah thanks for sharing all your comments and questions folks